but there's a kind of picture of quantum mechanics that I think you see in some of the philosophical discussion that I don't think people exactly make explicit, but I think is there in the background. It kind of goes something like this. Quantum mechanics is this uninterpreted calculus that the physicists don't really know how to make sense of. They, they can use it to run the process of setting up some system, doing some stuff to that system, and then predicting where the needle on the measurement device is pointing at the end of that process. They can turn the handle of the calculation, and it's graciously conceded um, that it gets the answers right quite accurately, but they have no idea what they're doing. It's just, some, it's just an un uninterpreted process, and it's our job, the philosophers, to come and save the physicist and make sense of what's going on and return the project to the sort of proper scientific realism that we all know and love and have established is the right way to think about scientific theories. Okay, if that was the right, then actually I think it would be philosophers of science, not physicists who should be um, worried by that state of affairs for their own field. Because that would kind of make quantum mechanics, if you like, the last redoubt of logical positivism. But considering that quantum mechanics is the language in which we do basically the entirety of modern physics, with the exception of gravitational phenomena, um, and that, that means it's the, the framework in which we do basically everything from understanding the Higgs boson to understanding structure formation in the super early universe, it would be quite a large redoubt of logical positivism. And a lot of the sort of arguments as to why something like a logical positivism and instrumentalism was supposed to be a way of thinking about scientific theories that wasn't viable, it was supposed to be not just that uh, somehow it was uh, giving up on our responsibilities to understand and explain or something to have that kind of take on scientific theories, but that in its own terms it wasn't supposed to work. The idea was supposed to be that um, if you, uh, if you really tried to reduce theoretical talk to some calculus of observation and experiment, you'd simply fail to do that. Our observational talk was so thoroughgoingly um, theory-laden that it just wasn't possible to separate out an observational calculus from the underlying interpreted theory. And similarly, the, the, the argument for scientific realism was supposed to be something like, it's just not possible to understand and explain the success of science unless we commit to some kind of acceptance of the existence of the entities that science seems to be positing. And if contemporary physics was getting by without positing any entities whatsoever, that would seem to be a problem for that basic argument. So, <laughs> close brackets on that, if, if that picture of quantum mechanics was correct, then it should be the philosophers of science who were tearing their hair out and redoing a lot of what they were doing. However, it's not correct. Uh, and it just as a, as a route into that, and as a route to getting to what I think the right way to think about the measurement problem is, um, go back to Simon's slogan, um, shut up and calculate. And that slogan was you know, invented as slightly tongue-in-cheek advice by David Merman. It's, it's sort of been taken up by the foundations of physics community almost as a term of abuse. Like, you, know, you, um, you guys are not taking the problem cor um, correct seriously enough. You're just shutting up and calculating. But calculation is quite useful. Uh, and it's not just useful because it tells you um, the result on some uh, unanalyzed measurement process. Calculation is useful because it brings us understanding. It's the fact, you know, my, my, uh, my ring here is, is colored gold. Um, we know why that is. Um, we know that gold is the color it is because of various relativistic effects in the electron shell of gold. Um, how do we know that? We calculated it, we worked it out. Um, how, do we, how is it that we think we understand why certain low temperature substances superconduct? We calculated it, we worked it out. Why is it that we think that the Higgs mechanism explains the mass of particles in, um, in the standard model? We calculated it, we worked it out, we checked. It would be bizarre, I think, to suppose that we don't, in some substantial sense, have an understanding of the colour of gold, or the process of superconductivity, or the mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking, or the formation of structure in the early universe, or the nuclear physics processes in the sun, or the transistor, or on and on and on and on and on. And I kind of give that list just as another reminder that quantum theory is not just this sort of isolated, problematic, you know, um, you know, ugly duckling bit of physics, that it's basically it's the language in which we do pretty much all of physics. Um, so since we do seem to, be, seem to have a lot of understanding of a lot of things in physics, and since those things are quantum things, we're obviously somehow succeeding in using quantum mechanics to get that kind of understanding. 
So let's pay a bit more attention to how we are actually using quantum mechanics um, and what the, um, what, what the method is that, uh, that's being applied by physicists in their use of quantum mechanics to explain, to understand. And then that's sort of our starting point for thinking, okay, how do we understand quantum mechanics itself and how do we fill in the admittedly partial bits of those understandings that rest on subtleties of quantum mechanics. And Carlo was kind enough to mention my term lab view, which is a sort of view of physics where, again, we prepare a system in a certain way, we operate on it, and then we apply a discrete measurement at the end of the process. Uh, but the context in which I brought that term up, um, at least one of the contexts, wasn't so much that we should move on from that picture of science to a better one, we philosophers, interpreters of quantum mechanics, etc., but more that that view of, um, of quantum mechanics wasn't adequate for the way quantum mechanics is, in fact, being used. And it's common to um, sort of think of cosmology as the par excellence example of that. But actually, you can be a lot more mundane than that. Um, you know, we, 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 we think we have a pretty good understanding of how the sun works. We think, in particular, we've got a pretty good understanding of the nuclear fusion processes inside the sun. Um, but we didn't prepare the sun. The sun was already there. We just kind of looked at it and investigated it. And our theory of how the sun works is something that's, that, that has an enormous number of moving parts and which meets data as a body and which meets a vast amount of data that's itself enormously theoretically mediated. So, for instance, a relevant component of our understanding of the sun is that we've got data on, the, on how hot the sun was at earlier points in history. How do we know that? Various, in, various extremely theory-laden inferences um, about the fossil record, um, about from geology, from, from paleontology. Only in the most Procrustean sense would it make sense to say that certain curve fitting to climate models in ancient, uh, ancient geology and paleontology count as a quantum measurement of the internal state of the sun. So, what, what, what is a way of understanding what we're doing in quantum mechanics that just, that, you know, even before solving the measurement problem, gets us a picture of how we're actually using this theory? And I think the answer is something like this. Um, the mathematical formalism of the theory is pretty much exactly, I agree, as, as, as Carly put it up. I don't think I'd want to emphasise in any particularly different way. We evolve, we, you know, as, as with classical mechanics, we uh, evolve states forward, we read properties off those states. Um, but we have a kind of awkward sleight of hand in how we interpret the mathematics of the theory. So if you think about classical mechanics, then in a classical theory, um, there's, a, there's a space of states, a phase space. Points in that space are, are supposed to represent physical properties of the system, physical quantities in Simon's terms. So if I know the phase space point, that's supposed to tell me all of the quantities that describe the physical system. And so one notion of state we have from classical mechanics is that notion, call it the representational notion of state. There's another notion of state we have from classical mechanics that enters when we start thinking about classical statistical mechanics, and that's state as some kind of probability function over the space. We can perfectly well write down equations of motion for a probability function. We can perfectly well consider a space of probability functions. In a sufficiently abstract and attenuated way, we can say that a probability function is a sort of state, and we can consider the state dynamics of those functions. So call that a probabilistic conception of, of a state. Um, and I think one good way to think about, you know, the best way I know to sort of just minimally read off what the physics community is doing in its use of, of quantum mechanics is that sometimes it treats the state on the representational conception of a state. Sometimes it treats the state on the probabilistic conception of a state, and it sort of moves incoherently between them. So we treat the state as representational whenever interference or entanglement or the other peculiarities of quantum mechanics make a non-representational reading illicit, and we treat the state as probabilistic whenever we want to get um, predictions out of it, because that's when we actually have to concretely use the Born rule. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do some kind of dynamical collapse process there. We don't invoke the presence of a measuring agent. We don't really, um, unless we're unsure about our own measurement processes, appeal to some measurement dynamics at all. We simply read probabilities off the state. We reinterpret the state probabilistically. And the, where, the, the, the place, from that point of view, the place I um, point at the measurement problem is that 
that understanding of, of, of physics seems prima facie incoherent. An understanding that says we'll move between these different ways of reading the state on kind of quite pragmatic grounds and we'll get away with it because decoherence phenomena mean that interference tends not to be visible in the situations where we use the probability rule. That is not a satisfactory way of understanding a physical theory. So from that point of view, what counts as solving the measurement problem? Well, you could try to get a more satisfactory way of understanding the theory as it's played out. Um, or you could replace the theory with a theory that's easier to understand. The philosophy of physics community, um, ha, or at least a large chunk of the philosophy of physics community, is really committed to the second strategy. Let's replace quantum mechanics with a better theory that's easier to understand. I, don't, I hope I'm not offending or insulting the philosophy of physics community when I suggest that this isn't necessarily where our skill set is best, is, is best applied. Um, Carlo listed various advantages and disadvantages of um, various interpretations. Um, the main thing I think is left out of the disadvantage column for several of those, um, and it's an overwhelmingly big thing to be in there, is can't at the moment reproduce the whole of quantum mechanics. So, for instance, Bohm's theory um, fairly unproblematically reproduces a certain chunk of quantum mechanics. It's highly problematic and contested the extent to which that can be extended beyond that particular narrow region of quantum mechanics. Uh, likewise, with dynamical collapse theories to an even larger extent. Other things being equal, there is an enormous advantage in thinking how can we make sense of the formalism and make sense of this as a satisfactory theory. And actually, as philosophers, I think we should particularly think that because um, uh, the basic mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics has been rock solid for 80 years, as Carly points out. I think it would be an exaggeration to say that the basic way of understanding scientific theories according to the consensus of the philosophy of science community has been rock solid for the last 80 years. <laughs> But then if you ask, okay, how can we make sense of the, th of the theory as we have it, we, we know that we can't read the probabilistic reading straightforwardly all the way down because of interference. Um, we could try reading the sort of representational conception of quantum mechanics all the way up. That leads you to the many worlds theory, which is my view as, as the best way to go. If that's viable, it has the enormous advantages of being extremely conservative. It becomes purely a way of making sense of physical practice in a way that doesn't require anything to be modified. Or we could rethink the way we conceptualize theories. We could move in Carlo's relational route. We could move in some kind of cubism, um, observer playing special role kind of route. Um, and again, I think those, it, it's, it's worth exploring those, those kind of routes. And again, a lot of my concern there, and I'll sort of stop with this point, is again, and in a rather different way, this seems to commit us to a sort of redoing of the way we do our physical practice. Um, so, the way we actually do, say, the physics of the classical limit or something, and in, in, there's decoherence models or statistical mechanical models, doesn't seem to involve bringing in observer notions or belief notions or relational notions. It just seems to involve running the calculations and interpreting them probabilistically, um, which, on, from an Everettian point of view, is the correct interpretation. It's just that those probabilities are emergent from something um, that's, that ultimately you think of as representational. So I'll, I think I'll stop there. I've probably had about my 15 minutes. Um, so, but just the sort of the, you know, Carla had his minimal take home message. My minimal take home message is the Everett interpretation is incredibly conservative and boring. <laughs> and that this is a virtue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>